Healthcare delivery at any time is an essential service, and during a pandemic, the cracks and gaps that normally exist are only more visible and potentially devastating. Nick Dunn is our Ontario Hub journalist covering the Northeast, and he joins us from Sudbury. Welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Jan. So before we get started, let's watch this short video to set the table. What is a remote nursing station? On-reserve nursing stations are set up as primary health care for remote First Nations in Canadian provinces. The federal government is responsible for funding and administering health care to these remote communities. Nursing stations help provide such services where hospitals and other medical facilities don't exist. Teams vary in number depending on the size of the community they're serving. Nurses require additional training to work in remote regions with fewer resources and where conditions may be different from what they've encountered in other parts of the province. If a patient needs more care, they are flown to the closest hospital. During crisis situations such as a pandemic, nursing station teams are even more important. However, critics have raised questions about the quality of training and level of staffing at nursing stations. In 2021, Indigenous Services Canada runs 21 nursing stations on remote First Nations in Ontario. So Nick, now that we know what nursing stations are, uh, can you tell us why they're so important and why they're needed? Yeah, well, as the uh, explainer mentions, uh, JN, they are the primary point of contact for healthcare in these communities, you know, where many small communities in Ontario or southern Ontario and even parts of northern Ontario, um, you know, might be within an hour's drive, a two hour drive to uh, a hospital. Um, you know, these are remote communities that are a several hundred kilometer flight away, right? So it's not like, uh, you know, you're, you, you have access um, that is easy to get to. So there needs to be some level of healthcare to deal with the acute and um, chronic needs uh, in any given community. So let's talk about the training. Um, the training that these nurses receive, is it special training? Is it any different from what a normal nurse would go through? Mm -hmm. Well, these nurses have to be a jack of all trades, you know. Uh, you're a handful of nurses in a community of several hundred people to upwards of a thousand. Um, so you're dealing with everything from diabetes to mental health calls to, you know, doing blood work, public health nursing. It's kind of everything, right? So you have to be ready and equipped to do everything. Um, on top of that, there's a lot of uh, cultural training, you know, being able to form relationships with these communities, get that familiarity, work with your patients. It's a very unique context. And uh, there's a whole lot of added responsibilities to it when you're working in such a small health or with such a small health team in a remote community. Well, let's talk about one community in your TVO.org article. You wrote about Sachigo Lake First Nation. Uh, tell us what we need to know about that community when it comes to uh, administering healthcare. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I spoke with uh, Dr. Ben Langer, uh, a physician uh, who works out of the Sioux Lookout area and visits about once uh, for a week each month, uh, approximately, give or take. Uh, and he was talking about how often there's only uh, two nurses uh, in his community uh, at a given time. Uh, there's supposed to be three uh, nurses, but he feels that uh, even when they're, you know, fully staffed, uh, they're having a lot of trouble. Now, this is just a, a normal day. Let's just add, you know, a pandemic to this. Uh, how does that impact delivering health care to, to a community like that? Yeah, so I mean, there's a number of things. Um, first of all, the mental health needs um, are already quite acute in a lot of uh, northern communities. Uh, and the pandemic, you know, like it's affecting, I think, everyone who's dealing with isolation, dealing with added mental health pressures, anxiety about uh, the state of this pandemic, uh, it is uh, increasing, you know, those mental health calls. That's what Dr. Ben Langer, Dr. Claudette Chase, Dr. Marilyn Koval, and a whole score of other doctors from the Sioux Lookout area are saying. And on top of that, um, you know, the needs, uh, people are people are afraid to go uh, seek health care. You know, they really don't want to have to go fly south uh, where there's COVID potentially uh, to get uh, the help they need or they, they, they just, you know, want to avoid gathering, right? So what happens is uh, people are more reluctant to seek health care, which means that by the time the doctors see them, they could be in a more deteriorated state and they could be more sick. So, you know, you're seeing people get more and more sick. And then thirdly, this whole rollout of vaccinations, it's been, you know, a terrific effort uh, by Orange, the federal government, First Nations and the province uh, to vaccinate tens of thousands of people in this compressed period of time. 
But, uh, you know, you're focusing so hard on COVID uh, that, uh, you know, chronic illnesses and kind of lingering issues kind of persist. You know, uh, Claudette Chase was telling me, you know, you're not keeping up with your pap smears. You're not catching up with your uh, child vaccinations, et cetera, et cetera. You know, you're just dealing with COVID and the, that acute, acute kind of level of health care. Staffing is hard that there are, you know, there are high levels of burnout. It's hard to maintain people. Uh, they're also saying that infrastructure is key, you know, that even if they had uh, people coming in, that there's no there's no room to house them. Uh, so the they, they, they sent a letter to uh, Mark Miller uh, earlier this month, just kind of uh, reaching out for resources because, uh, you know, this is the kind of like first level of, uh, you know, defense for these communities when it comes to getting their health care issues dealt with. Um, you know, the federal government uh, has since uh, responded, you know, they've uh, been conducting meetings uh, with this group of doctors, but uh, ISC has told me, or Indigenous Services Canada told me that, you know, they acknowledge that uh, staffing is an issue. They've talked about numerous programs for retention, you know, additional funding for staffing, and they, they mention a figure of $785 million dollars spent in Ontario to date uh, for all healthcare needs regarding the pandemic. That goes everything from PPE to the vaccines to, you know, indigenous organizations around the province. Um, it's a very, you know, it, it, it kind of includes all the funding uh, that has been provided at kind of all levels for not just First Nations, but indigenous organizations uh, and, uh, you know, families as well, Indigenous families. Now, very quickly, Nick, I do want to ask you, you know, this is something that, you know, isn't new in terms of, um, you know, the, sh the, sh the sh staff shortages in these communities. How else can healthcare outcomes be improved in these regions after talking to the doctors? Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, I mean, nursing stations, you know, that's really at the, the, the community level and that's where the acute needs are being met. But, you know, you, I've, and everyone I've spoken to about this uh, from uh, Claudette Chase, from Ben Langer, uh, from other doctors and uh, even Janet Gordon, the chief operating officer at the Sioux Lookout First Nations Health Authority, you know, she was really talking about the need to address those uh, fundamental social determinants of health, you know. Um, you know, the reason why the needs are so acute is because, uh, you know, there are issues of infrastructure, of housing, of access to things like water and electricity. And if you can, you know, work to prevent, you know, things from getting to the point of needing acute care, you're going to be reducing in the long term stress on places like nursing stations and other facilities. I want to thank you very much for joining us tonight on the show. That's Nick Dunn, our Northeastern Ontario Hub Journalist. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you.